Hi, everybody. That was a big... All right, so let's start off with the questions. We'll get to the, the bio stuff later. Everyone on three, I want to hear it yelled out. One, two, three. Thank you. Everyone ought to be getting that. So this was actually Trivia 100 from the 2006 qualifier round of Capture the Flag. They were very clever. Next year's question was, was very difficult. Um, we, we had a hard time solving this, uh, so of course that. And then uh, the following year, any guesses if you weren't already, didn't already know? Any guesses? Hack Blank Planet. Thank you. Yes. Yes. We were all wondering next year what would they have done if, uh, if they ran it this year. Ken Shota did not end up uh, running, running it this year, but it would have been interesting to see. Now, of course, the point that this does bring home, there is a lot of inside jokes. If you came across this out of the blue, it might have been a little bit more difficult uh, not knowing sort of the prior history. In hindsight, it's stupid easy, but it helps to sort of be prepared. And that's really what this talk is about. A lot of this is meant to be sort of background, the kind of the inside story, the inside jokes, how it runs, what it is. So when you're wandering through the Capture the Flag room, uh, you know what's going on. If you want to participate, you want to compete, hopefully we can, we can go some hints that, that cover that too. So I'm Cypher Tex. Uh, this is me and my computer at home right now. That's what I use. It's not. Um, it's probably no surprise, I prefer Linux over Windows. These days, though, Steve Jobs takes more of my money. Uh, the age-old debates, I gotta go with VI. Uh, ever important, ever, ever important issue over Verunder. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's the only way. Another big uh, debate uh, where I, I fall on, I'm afraid, uh, for the Ruby lovers out there, I just like the Python, so uh, no applause but no booze, I'll stick with that. Uh, in terms of Pepsi versus Coke, Neither. I'm sorry. Thank you. Probably more relevant, though, to this talk, I'm actually a member of this team. It's pronounced last place. Uh, it has ridiculous etymology and meanings that we came up with after the fact, actually. We really just kind of came up with it, I think, and tried to fit it to it. Uh, the team looks like this. That's me in the back. Uh, I, I, I like my anonymity, apparently. No, just the, the shot that we got. There's two guys not pictured. Um, I want to do a brief run through the rest of the team members because, uh, hey, we, we won a couple years and I want to show off uh, the guys that uh, made my CTF experience so great. This here is Plato, probably the only, the first, last, and only lawyer to ever win Capture the Flag. And I'm not talking about like he had a JD. This guy is a lawyer in his day job, which is pretty stinking sweet when you think about it. Team Captain Atlas, if you were here for the last talk and you heard the Ken Shota guys talking, they said Atlas was the one guy that came in the individual, just got his mind blown, came back and you know really learned a huge amount. I mean, four years ago, he really wasn't doing the security stuff all that much, and now he is just phenomenally good. Uh, he really applied himself and threw himself into it, led this team, put this team together, built it, uh, and then we not only he had a solo win, but then we won uh, two years in a row after that. Um, this guy right here is actually in the front row, so make sure to pat him on the back on the way out. I'm borrowing his black badges up front. Mazendo played the uh, network sniffer, played defense, did kind of whatever. Talk a little bit more about the roles later, but uh, you'll notice that everybody out here had a specific function, right? And it kind of mattered. You didn't just all show up and do random stuff. Uh, we've got Shurukin, who besides being a phenomenally good sysadmin and kept the services going, is the resident IRC troll. It's a very important role that everyone needs on their team to have somebody in IRC hanging out, uh, keeping things lively when you've been up for 48 hours straight. Fury, or maybe his twin, he has an evil twin acting on defense here. Uh, Doc Brown is our reverser. Actually, the, the Nops Us website that the Kinshoto guys mentioned, uh, there's a link to it later, has, uh, is actually primarily Doc who, who did a lot of the write-ups, and he did a huge amount of work and uh, put that together. He took all our team wiki and notes from a lot of the, the past comp uh, competitions, put it up online, and then we're for a guy over here who doesn't get uh, mentioned a whole lot. Also an extremely good reverser exploiter. Really need that skill set. We don't have a poo uh, shown in the slides here. Um, he was out for this particular picture. Was uh, an ex-Marine. So uh, besides actually being you know, an actual tech technical guy uh, was also physical security, which you should never underestimate the aspect of physical security in uh, Capture the Flag. And then also J-Rod was uh, also not in this picture, another good exploiter. As for me, defense, offense, reversing, I've kind of done it all, which I take it to mean I'm just not very good at any of them, but they keep letting me be on the team, so I'll, I won't complain. So, Capture the flag itself. Uh, it's been billed as a lot of things, the ultimate hacking game, ultimate legal hacking game. 
Uh, reverse engineering, exploitation, as the Kenshota guys were up here explaining last time, this is really it, their response to in a world of web app security. Uh, they wanted this to be binary exploitation, reverse engineering, hardcore stuff that uh, in some ways is a hard skill set to develop these days because a lot of the security research nowadays in the web world kind of misses out on this the binary history in the background. And so they want to make this just you know lots and lots of binary fun. DD Tech, which is putting on the competition this year, uh, claims that they have the same focus, and so presumably right now going on is uh, the, the beginning of Capture the Flag for, for this year, uh, doing the same kind of thing, very uh, binary exploitation based, not a whole lot of uh, command injection, uh, cross-site scripting, SQL injection. I miss it, but uh, I get made fun of for being a web weenie, so. In terms of timeline, uh, if you saw the last talk, there were sort of a couple different eras or epochs of Capture the Flag. The first five years it was put on basically by the goons, the BOFH, and um, there was a lot of different formats. There was really a lot of kind of finding their place. They didn't really know what the best format, what the best structure for this event, what this thing could become. They just had a bunch of servers. You could bring your own server. You could just show up. Uh, it was very chaotic, not particularly organized. A lot of the winning tended to be winning kind of just because you gamed the system or figured out how to maximize it, and not so much because you had the best technical prowess. And so there was, there was some attempts to fix that. Uh, the ghetto hackers came along. And after, you know, I don't know if you can even see. This slide sucks. I'm sorry. My timeline software not so good. Um, but the ghetto hackers won uh, there towards the end, and you know, then they came and actually put it on. This is um, an uh, uncommon theme that the people who have been winning for a little while decide to go put it on because they think they know how to do it as well or better. Uh, so the ghetto hackers came along, and they really made a, a bunch of uh, improvements and revelations. Uh, Caesar has got a, a presentation you can pull up online at Black Eye. We spoke about how they designed. They, they brought in game theory. They brought in a lot of thought and planning and design. They introduced the idea of a qualifier round, the idea that before DEF CON a couple months in advance, you would have a qualifier round, sort of figure out who the teams were, and then when people would show up, only those teams would participate in the capture the flag, which is why we have the ACTF or OCTF uh, in parallel meant to sort of resurrect the old school free for all kind of anybody can show up and join which has you know advantages in being a bit more open but less structured less uh, kind of cutthroat less probably less technically demanding I uh, hope none of the DC 949 guys get mad at me for saying that but I think it's probably a safe bet um, then of course we have Ken Shoto. Ken Shoto has put it on uh, the previous four years. They've really kind of refined it. They took the sort of architecture and the game design if, again if you saw the last presentation you heard a lot about that um, and they took it to an art. This year we have uh, DD Tech, who nobody really knows. They're still kind of keeping mum on who they are and their history. They're obviously very familiar with Capture the Flag, but don't sort of, none of the major usual players that play have any idea who they are, so it's kind of interesting to see the mystery men. They, they swear that this weekend their identities will be revealed to, to some sort, but we'll see how that goes. So here's the uh, qualifying round this year. If you were to do the qualifying round, it was June 5th, uh, 2300 uh, Greenwich Mean, and it ran straight for 48 hours. So uh, one of the differences between the qualifying round and the finals is that the qualifying round, it just goes straight through. So you sleep, you don't sleep, but however you choose to do it, you need to sort of be putting your points in the whole time. It is fun to sort of watch and figure out who is in what time zone based on when they flatline. Like, they, well, they were sleeping then, and they were awake. And uh, you compare the teams. Here's the top 15 teams. Uh, depending on the, the year, the top seven to nine teams will make it through the qualifying round and then join the last year's winners. You, you probably can't read the font. It's really small. Feel free to grab the slides online later. Actually, the raw data is online as well. Um, you can go pull it up and animate the graph to your heart's content or play with it if you like. But you'll see there's, just, there's a lot of ups and downs, a lot of backs and forth. There's a couple of strong players. Um, and so these teams, uh, it's important to know. It's a Sun Tzu quote. I'm sure it's relevant. It's got to be. It's a security talk. Uh, so we're talking about knowing our enemies. It, it probably says something like that, right? So those, those 10 teams that we had uh, that qualified, the 10 teams including last year's winners, I'm going to go ahead and do a brief bio rundown. Because when you walk through, like you see the team name, if you're not sort of in the kind of click, if you've not been following or reading or you don't know what's going on, you don't really know who's who, what's what, and it's a lot more entertaining to know, ah, that team's got a vengeance against that team and so and so. So to give you a little bit of the sort of backstory on who's what, uh, we'll start with School of Root. They uh, not only won last year, but they've also uh, won in 2004. Uh, are incredibly good. They crushed the competition last year. They were first place. They actually didn't have to participate in the qualifiers this year. They had a buy as the previous year's winners chose to anyways. And uh, at, the, at the last minute, they won. It's, it's uncertain uh, how much they were holding back. As the previous year's qualifiers, they had an automatic buy into the finals. So they didn't have to participate, but they did. And at the very, very end, they won. It was sort of... Uh, 
not arrogant, but uh, demonstrating that they could have been ahead earlier, possibly, but they chose not to. They didn't want to impact the final or the qualifying round. So the, the winner of the qualifying round gets to choose the next question. So if somebody who's already got a buy gets a question right before anybody else does, they would impact the game. And so it's sort of the, the sporting, the gentlemanly thing to do if you have the buy to not influence the game. And they were very good at that until the last few minutes of the game when they solved one that nobody had solved just to show that they were that much ahead. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how much ahead they are. They're led by Chris Eagle, uh, who is, you, you heard earlier in the other talk, if you were here, a, what did I put, binary ninja and pirate rolled into one. He's just wicked good. They, they came up with that interpreted machine that he wrote in, you know, they, their own brand new virtual machine that he reversed in a weekend and wrote an interpreter for. This is just mind-boggling how good he is. It's scary. Um, uh, yeah, uh, he's extremely good. He leads, leads a great team. Uh, and then John Boss is the other team captain of School of Root, who sort of heads up the organizational side of it. Because as we get into it, the roles really matter. You need not just good technical, but you need good organizational. You need the other stuff. Uh, Chris Eagle also released last year, just after uh, Capture the Flag was over, and he had crushed everyone, finishing, I might add, with Guitar Hero at the end. They were showing off their heads so far. It was, uh, they, they, they told everyone they didn't want it to appear jerks, but they were a little bit ahead, so they could take the time off. It was a, a pretty good move for uh, somebody so far ahead. But after CTF was over, he released uh, Collaborate, a really cool IDA plugin, as a result of kind of the need of doing collaborative reverse engineering. And so this is some of the this some product that's come out of basically his experience, and he also wrote a book that went along with that. that the software went along with. So Capture the Flag has sort of made a difference in kind of beyond just this fun little game uh, in that. Team Awesome was second place in the qualifiers, mostly first timers. I know a couple of the guys on a team. It'll be interesting. They led the entire quals, uh, but the very end. So the question is how much was School of Root letting them and how much were they not? So uh, it'll also be interesting to see because they, they did well in qualifiers, but teams that in the past and won qualifiers and not done well in the finals. So watch the score. It'll be interesting to see if these kind of top teams in the qualifiers are also the top teams as you go through Capture the Flag. Sexy Pandas have been around for a while. They're also known as the Pandas with Gambas, Osu Tatake Sexy Pandas, Wooby Wooby Pandas, Sexy Pondas, and then the Latin name for a panda, which I'm not going to bother trying to pronounce. Uh, they have uh, not only are sexy pandas, as you can see. They look like very sexy pandas. Um, done extremely well. They participate in a lot of international CTFs. They're mostly um, uh, they're, they're Spanish-speaking uh, gents. And, and most of these folks, we kind of know each other. You get to see them year after year, and they do extremely well. They tend to have a strong start and then die off. But if they can uh, keep their, their level of, of uh, profit up or you know, scoring up, they will be extremely dangerous. Uh, and they were in third place again in the finals. So PLUS is uh, actually the one of many uh, Republic of Korea teams. There's a lot of South Koreans that um, are, have been showing up in Capture the Flag just the last couple of years, doing extremely well. I think there's, there's at least like four teams that are either entirely or partially made up of uh, folks from South Korea. So there's a very strong showing. Um, I think they like play StarCraft, like an Olympic sport over there. So it's, my guess is that may have something to do with it. It sounds like a pretty cool place for a bunch of hackers. So. Uh, primarily undergraduates from the university. Again, they were fourth in Capture the Flag. Shellfish has been around forever. University of California, Santa Barbara. These guys are led by Giovanni Vigna, and uh, they put on their own Capture the Flag called the ICTF, which is a lot of fun. It's a great Capture the Flag uh, to, to participate. You can do it remotely, primarily for academic groups, but others can participate usually. Uh, they won in 2005 and have been around, and a lot of the qualifiers uh, are extremely good, very, very nice folks. Song of Freedom, another one of the Korean folks, a little bit quieter, don't uh, know much about them. And when asked for uh, any kind of logo or bio, their, their response was no comment. So uh, it's not at all surprising that folks like their, their privacy. Lalo skaters dropping from raffle copters. These guys, aside from the awesome name, um, but you like my, my logo? I made that. Now, here's the cool part. Um, that made that two hours that it took to do that worth it. Thank you. Except Keynote can't loop, so otherwise you would be continuously falling and coming back. Um, they have a much cooler logo on their shirts if you go nowadays. I wish they had given that to me and uh, I didn't have to make this. But uh, they were really interesting because back in uh, 2007, three guys from the, the, this team sort of put together a team to do the qualifiers and just blew everybody away in the qualifiers, which is really pretty impressive because uh, the qualifiers, not only because they're 48 hours straight, but have a widely diverse set of challenges. And so to have just a small team do so well is extremely impressive. Uh, and again, they're here at the finals now, so we'll see how they do. They've also picked up a couple members, and I think if you know these guys or are friends with them or are interested in a slot, every now and then 
teams are willing to pick up kind of Ronin and have them join their team if they're under eight people, which is usually the table limit. Uh, so if you really are polite and careful and can demonstrate your skills some way, you might consider asking. I make no guarantees or promises. Most folks tend to keep their teams the way they want it because you have no idea if it's a spy from another team or not uh, when they come and ask to join you. So the Routards are a French-speaking team, originally just all French. They're now French-speaking. I'm not even going to try to read the names. Uh, it would not be pleasant, uh, but uh, Hanzo's the team captain. Uh, and again, they have an, uh, the distinguished honor of having been in the finals the last three years in a row. The only other two teams to do that being the Pandas and uh, School of Root. So again, they're very, very commonly here and uh, very skilled. Wow Hacker, I've been around for a couple years, another one of the Korean teams. And it's uh, about all I know about that. Sapheads uh, showed up at the last minute. Uh, this year they made it because of a couple other teams dropping out. And um, they're a group, a combination of a couple other groups that I'm not going to read. It'll be in the slide notes if you want, that uh, kind of join together some friends online. They're from all over the place. It's great to see a lot of internationally mixed teams, not folks just that you know are friends locally, but uh, a couple of these teams are really draw from all over the place. They are also behind a really, really awesome, uh, probably the best Capture the Flag write-up ever came out this year. It's a comic book style write-up explaining how they solved one of these binary challenges. And uh, it was a, a lot of fun. It's, it's linked to in the, the, the slide notes. You can pull up that. All right, I've talked enough. Let's go back to a challenge. This one, I'm going to warn you, is a little bit more difficult. That said, the rewards are that much greater. I have a Frisbee valued at far, far under $1,000. <laughs> much closer to a dollar at Target, but I'm not saying. Um, that is, it, it goes to the, if you can't see it in the back, it's the uh, skull and crossbones with heart-shaped eyes. It's very sweet. Uh, that goes to the, whoever, whoever can answer the next question. So take your time. Uh, if you've already seen this, please don't answer. You're on your honor here. It's no fun if you've already received it. Anybody got any ideas? We'll kind of talk through it a little bit. So x86, EBFE. Oh, we got a possible answer. Your answer was beef. Always a safe bet. Incorrect in this case, however, is specifically because PPC instructions are never two bytes long. Uh, well, yeah, let, anyways. Yes? Incorrect. Incorrect. So EBFE, let's start to walking through it, is somebody tell me what EBFE is. I heard somebody say it, but he didn't count. Anybody else? <laughs> Jump dollar minus two, thank you. So this will spin your CPU. It says jump to myself. And again, this was an actual question during a, a capture the flag qualifiers. Granted, you had online access and manuals and docs, which helps. And I'm asking you to do this from memory. That's why it's worth a Frisbee. <laughs> so who knows their PPC instructions? I'll even take the mnemonic. Somebody want to give me a mnemonic for a PPC instruction that is equivalent of a jump negative two in x86? Do they have jumps in PPC code? Anybody? This is a hacker convention, guys. Come on. We got a hand up. Well, uh, yes. It is a branch instead of jump. What might the argument to the branch be? You're kind of thinking along the right idea, um, but maybe it's not based on the end but the beginning of the instruction instead, in which case it would be zero. Oh, we have a winner. <laughs> Excellent. All right. You want to try to? Oh, he's going to make me give it to him that way there. All right. Thank you. I promise I won't drag it out next time so long. So game mechanics. I mentioned there's two halves to this game, right? Capture the flag has the qualifying round, which these, some of these lightning questions are coming from the qualifying round. If it seems intimidating, well, it is. But, I mean, don't worry about that too much because you learn, you figure it out. That's the whole point of it. I've learned more doing capture the flag than I have preparing for it or getting ready for it just in the competition because of uh, the fun that you have. You get folks that you enjoy doing stuff with, and it doesn't matter where you participate in the quals. Doing the quals is an absolute blast. There's no reason not to do it. It's over a weekend, so even if you're working, I don't care. You can fit your schedule usually, and you can do it. It's a lot of fun. Um, the skill set tends to be a little bit different. As I mentioned, qualifiers runs for 48 hours straight. So... It's more of a Jeopardy style board. I'll flip ahead to this real quick. I'll go back. Um, this was the one from this year. DD Tech actually added even more problems than normal. So you've got one through 500 in six different categories. So 30 different questions, binaries, challenges, forensics, all sorts of off the map. Uh, the categories were uh, pursuits, trivial, crypto badness, packet madness, binary eliteness, potent ponables, and forensics. But ignore the categories because I think it was a packet one and the crypto and a crypto one and the binary one. The, the, the sort of categories are kind of general rules of thumb rather than a hard 
and fix thing. Generally speaking, these were just, there was binaries, there was network captures, you were doing all sorts of interesting, bizarre stuff. The write-ups for these are all online, uh, if you go into the links at the end. Don't cheat though, it's kind of like playing a video game and looking up the answers, you're like, that's no fun, you don't want to ruin, ruin it for you. Try it yourself, do the problems first, and then see, uh, see what you can learn first, and then you know, use the help only if you need it. So, the qualifying round, like I said, is 48 hours straight, it's independent, it's remote, you can be anywhere when you're running the uh, Capture the Flag, you log into the server, you get the account. 200 plus teams participated, or at least 200 plus teams scored points. Certainly some were ghost teams or duplicate teams or others, but it's definitely a lot of people that get involved. Like I said, there's no reason not to. It's a lot of fun. Uh, you, you don't have to even play to win. You can play just to get all the questions and have fun and enjoy it. There's, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. Um, the winner of the qualifying round, like I said, the top seven to nine teams, depending on, on how many are allowed in, depending on the year, uh, gets into the gets into the finals here at at, Cap, at DefCon the CTF the the hours I say ten ten six Friday to Saturday Friday to Sunday at DefCon for the the final the main capture the flag nah that can change like I said today they hadn't started I don't think when when I go into the speaker room so uh, things were a little slow to kick off but that's to be expected with a, a new team doing it uh, so that's flexible. Take it with a grain of salt. The interesting thing is, though, even though the capture the flag hours end, the work does not. So the teams will go up to their hotel room, they'll go up, and they'll keep working on this stuff because you've got the binaries, you've got the, the server image to work on afterwards. So Q&A qualifiers. Finals is an actual live server. It's defending and attacking live other people. And this is sort of the more interesting piece. This is where everyone's like, well, I'm just going to bring my server that's X or Y. I'm going to do this. And So before you kind of get into that, it helps to understand uh, how, how it's set up. Oh, right. The, the, the spoils. Uh, you get the Entry to CTF if you get in the top in the qualifiers. The, the winning team at the actual capture the flag gets uh, a black badge. Here's uh, the, the two that our team got from a couple years ago. The Uber badge, of course, the infamous DEF CON Uber badge. It's admission for life. It's street credit. It's You get a leather jacket. You get dates with people of the opposite sex. You get pers we didn't, you didn't get that with? Oh, we're both married, so I guess we didn't do that either. But I thought that was a part of it. It's supposed to be part of it. Um, Oh well. Uh, so at the main event, though, did my voice crack? I'm not 16. I don't. I look like it still, but I'm not. Um, at the main event, every team gets their own identical server. So like I said, in years past, things were more chaotic. Everything was a little bit random. And this year, you, if you saw the topology last time, every team gets a VM. It's snapshotted. You're in a jail. It's been FreeBSD. It was Solaris one year. That was painful. It's been back to FreeBSD. I have no idea what they're doing. I think it was probably free. Is anybody? It's FreeBSD 7.2. Interesting, they've upped the version uh, this year. So right now, the teams in there are doing FreeBSD 7.2, uh, playing with, with some binaries. Um, you are usually the network upstream. Now, a lot of this is sort of general, gen generalities. You have to be very prepared for changing things on the fly. The rules will change every year. In fact, the rules this year, if you go into the Capture the Flag room, grab one of these guys. It's got the updated rules. They're very different from the rules I'm going to describe to you from years past. Mostly the same style of gameplay, uh, but the scoring system is a little bit different. There's no longer breakthrough points for the first team that solves a problem. It's a zero-sum game. There's only the same total, and then it just shifts based on percentages in terms of who's done what. Uh, so there's some of these differences. It'll be very interesting to see how that, that affects the gameplay, because uh, it's always about kind of gaming the system, right? You always want to have the optimum um, plan of attack. You want to be prepared to do a lot of things. You've got flags. Hence the capture the flag part, right? Um, these flags can be anything. Typically, though, yeah, they've been base 64 strings of a fixed length, and so you can recognize them. Um, th there's a lot of it that goes, it goes on again behind the scenes in terms of you have to track who stole what flag from whom because you have to know when they got it, where they got it from, what service, so when you get points, if you do a breakthrough point, you have to kind of figure out all this stuff. If you're tracking zero sum game, you have to track. So, all that is very carefully set up. And running a CTF is way harder than participating. And I'm very glad to have participated and no desire to run it if I can help it because that would be a lot of work. Um, but stealing these flags and then submitting them is, is the way you actually get your points. The other way you get points, or rather you keep your points, is your SLA. So every team is required to keep their services up. I can have perfect security when I unplug my server. It doesn't help me much at actually maintaining service. And so to keep people from doing that, sort of taking the, the nuke approach, your points are all, uh, sum total all your points from either stealing a key, from overwriting your overwrite key onto somebody else's keys, all of that is multiplied by your SLA. So if you're up for 90% of the service checks you make, you get 90% of whatever the bucket of points you got. SLA matters. This is sort of the biggest, it's not like an inside trick or secret, this is just really, really important. Keep your services up. If you've got defensive techniques and tricks that you think about how you can re rearrange the server, great. Test them very carefully. Never, ever fail a service check because that will screw your score very, very quickly. 
So, roles. Thank you. A successful CTF team has a lot of different roles. I mentioned earlier, yeah, it was pretty lame. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier a lot of people um, a lot of people think they're just going to be reverse engineering and that's like all it's going to take. I mentioned my team has a bunch of different skill sets. You really have to have the complete sort of picture. You've got to have a leader. You need somebody just to organize the team. I mentioned Atlas and, and, and our team is an excellent leader. Uh, yeah, the herding cats. Uh, this should not be your best technical person. This should not be the guy who's the best reverser, should not be the guy who's the best exploiter because that's a waste of his talent. It needs to be somebody who's organizationally good, who can motivate, who can track, who can keep communication going. It sounds stupid and silly to say like teamwork is really important and really, I, it really is. If you don't get your people working together, you're never gonna win. Your network administrator, is the guy who's not only setting up your firewall, but also monitoring the network, and it's maybe a split role. Teams can obviously implement this differently, but all these skill sets are going to be used. Um, he's the guy who's watching all the attacks that come against you. He needs to be working with the defense to let them know new attacks. He needs to be working with the reverses to let them know when he sees a new attack to help them to figure out to, to others. You've got to all work together. Of course, you've got the reversing and exploitation. I didn't Google image search exploitation. Sorry, decided that would be a bad idea. Um, this is the main skill set. It really is. Like I said, this is a binary exploitation. So if you want to do this, you've got to have somebody on your team. You may have that one rock star who's your good exploiter, and that's okay because you need all the skill sets. But somebody's got to do this. You need your sysadmin. Somebody's got to keep your services up. That SLA, I told you, is, is crucially important. Keep your system running. And you don't know what you're going to get. You may get Slayers, you may get FreeBSD, you may get something bizarre, and you need somebody with a lot of experience and all this stuff. So Defender is similar to sysadmin. He, he, he plays, a, it looks like the same. He's on the server, he's monitoring, he's keeping out. The difference though is the defender's goal is purely to frustrate the opposition. His goal is to think of all the nice, no, all the not nice things you can do to your people. You want to be dropping long live connections. You want to be moving binaries around that the score bot checker won't use when it logs in. Anytime when you can figure out a behavior that's definitely a human and not a bot, you want to kill it. You want to be actively involved in maintaining the security of your server. And this will be especially interesting as you know the zero sum game of scoring, how that impacts uh, the number of points when defense matters more. In years past, it's almost been easier to ignore defense. You were better off not doing anything on defense to keep that SLA up, uh, but we'll see if that changes. A gopher or gophers are critically important. Do not underestimate uh, how nice it is to have somebody to get you food because hackers do not live on caffeine alone, I'm afraid to say, for maybe 24 to 48 hours. But beyond that, you're gonna need a little bit more than that. I said it earlier, you have to have teamwork. Uh, my team has never been the best at reversing, never been the best at exploitation, never been the best at dirty tricks. Okay, we were pretty good at dirty tricks. We'll get to that next. But we weren't the best in just about any area. We worked together really well. Team size is kind of a controversial topic. Uh, School of Root, the guys that won last year, have a big team. Not everyone is necessarily good or in and involved in the same degrees, but in some ways a big team can hurt you. You need people coordinating and working together more than you need small, more than you need, you know, just a lot of people to throw different problems. That said, you probably can't win with like a five person team, no matter how good those five people are, because there's something like 20 binaries you get at the start of the game, and you're doing the network monitoring, the sysadmin, you're doing so many, all these other roles that you've just got to have a number of people. So a quick word on sort of CTF etiquette. Um, I'm a really nice guy, I promise I am, but I have been rather rude to people and ask them to leave the table because you don't know if they're a spy or not. I've sent spies against other teams. I would not be surprised, and I know for a fact other teams have done it to us too. So if somebody says, hey, I don't want you watching my screen, they don't take it personally. When you're in the room and everyone is going on, it gets pretty competitive. So just as a word of warning, you don't shoulder surf these guys or try to see what you're doing. I know it's really interesting. That's why I love to do it. But like I said, just, just don't take it the wrong way when they ask you to leave. All right. Another lightning round. It's a little x86 instruction heavy. So who's got their Intel manual on, a, on, on their laptop and wants to pull it out? I'll settle for the mnemonic. You don't have to assemble it in your head this time. Implement the following in one instruction. What does this look like? I don't have a Frisbee for this, though, so maybe we'll I'll give you a water cup. It's not. It's not. It's it, the tricky part. Is it's 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 not an inapt description of what's going on. It's close, I guess, would say, but not quite it. There's there's so what will be yeah what will be put into EBX at the end of this? 
Uh, so the interesting thing is, so we're shifting one by ECX and anding it. So what's the only possible result? Can I have 14 bits in EBX at the end of this? I cannot. How many bits could I have in EBX at the end of this? I can only have one bit. There will only ever be one bit at a time in EBX at the end of this. We're going to skip this. This is not all that interesting. It's not all like this either. I like this stuff. This is a bit scan write. So it's actually a nice long C loop that comes down to just, hey, look for the last one and put it in this other register. Isn't that neat? OK. Now, the fun stories. This is where I hope I don't burn bridges. It is a hacking competition, folks. Don't be surprised if there is some hacking involved in this competition. Uh, let's, uh, let's all say it together again. Security is only as strong as the weakest link. Excellent. So what's the weakest link? Humans, obviously. But specifically, what is it that we do or related to our usage of systems? It's, if you want to hack a system, what's the, just the simplest, stupidest way in, besides asking? Steal it. Physical security, yes. Come on. What's under the keyboard? Their password. Thank you. Yes, your password. Almost always one of the weakest links of the passwords. So there's been different ways to get root access to your server at the beginning of the CTF when you actually come in and you get access to your VM before everybody else does it. Um, one of the ways was that you got a text file and it's in the root of your system that had your password. It was your database password. It was the password you logged into the score server with, and it was with your root password. Most teams managed to get this right and change the root password. It's a rather important step in securing your box, changing your password from one that someone else can read. Right. Not everybody does. Uh, School of Root actually owned somebody that last year, and I got to give them credit because they could have literally owned every service immediately because they had root in somebody else's box and they chose not to. That was a very gracious thing to do. They have a lot of self-control, let's just say that. Um, I'm not sure I would have been so, so strong. But one of the things you could do with this, this password, once you've changed it, what good is it, right? I can log into the score server as you. Well, that's nice. I can see your score. What else? Well, I can change your overwrite key. One of the little buttons in the score server says change my overwrite key, where you can change the key that you use to overwrite other people's flags to indicate you were the one that exploded that service and overwrote their flag, right? That's kind of a handy thing. Only one overwrite key can be active at a time. If I click that button, your scripts must be updated, or you will not get any overwrite points. So. For a little while on Saturday back in uh, DEF CON 15, School of Roots overwrites went like this. And then they noticed and figured someone hit the button, and so then it went back up again. And 15 minutes later, I pushed the button again, and another 45 minutes went by, and no one noticed, and it flatlined again. And then they noticed, and I did it again. And so for about like three to four hours, they were denied a bunch of overwrites because mainly they weren't paying attention, primarily because they didn't protect this password, but also it was like the little things. You really got to get this right. You got to protect your passwords. You got to remember, what could I do that's nasty with the score server? Um, to be fair, we asked before we did this. Now, one of the other things that's interesting, like I said, they don't like the web weenies in this. They like the binary exploitation. There's usually one or two web services just to toss a bone here and there. Uh, but one of the other teams had a really clever idea. We were stealing people's passwords that they left unprotected. The other team set up their web services that they were running with cross-site request forgery attacks. So if you just visited their web service, your browser would go to the score server on your account and reset your overwrite token. And I have no idea if this worked. This may have been successful against half the teams that were there, and we'll never know because that's not the kind of thing you can find out. You have to go back and look at the graphs for some more flat lines and overwrites. Um, so sometimes even though web security isn't really designed to be part of it, you can kind of make it part. One of my favorites is last year, the badge uh, hacking that occurred. Is it, who was here for the awards ceremony last year and heard what the, the badges we're not a, you're all either ashamed to admit it or you weren't a whole lot here. Well, the, 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 winning, the winning badge was uh, you could wave and do a password and you plugged it in. It was, it was cute. But the second place badge, that was my favorite. That was a true dirty tricks badge. The second place badge, um, the guys that, that hacked that programmed a bunch of shut off your computer IR codes. It went in and out of front row on a Mac and HP laptops would actually go into hibernate, which takes forever. And then it would come out and would go in and it would come out. It would just, just make your computer unusable. And, oh yeah, and they clipped a resistor. So these things worked from like way far away. They'd just be walking around the conference with their badges transmitting this code. And so you'd see laptops popping in and out. There's, um, <clears throat> there's a recording last year, uh, these, uh, DV cams they were using where one of the Macs suddenly got a little antsy and uh, you, I forget which talk it is, but if you, if you go through the web video archives, one of the recordings gets a little <laughs> hard to watch because the camera suddenly shut off. I don't know why. 
Uh, one of the teams, and I feel a little bad for the guy in the Wow Hackers who had an HP laptop because this, his computer was unusable for most of Saturday. There was a couple guys who had these hacked badges just dying with this guy. So I feel a little bad. But uh, again, it goes in the capture the flag. It goes into dirty tricks. It goes into cool hacking. The moral of the story is you better shut off every interface on your laptop. Go into your BIOS and disable your Wi-Fi. Don't just do it in the OS. Tape electrical tape over you could actually put your finger over with the other badge it would still go through in the laptop centers i mean you better shut off everything you can uh to do it so i guess the essence of judo of which i know nothing but i've heard is using your opponent's strength against themselves right remember that virtual machine they were just talking about in the last talk that chris eagle the one guy the only guy that saw this crazy ridiculous problem it was unbelievable it was actually i think saturday they said sunday morning i think uh, if i'm remembering correctly it was actually saturday morning it was the first night of the competition chris eagle came back and he had solved it. This is just ridiculous. This hard problem built basically for him, he had solved, uh, except he left it world readable. <clears throat> so we were having shells in their boxes. We had his patched binary. We have no idea what the vulnerability was. I haven't gone back and looked at it. It was a huge amount of changes he had made to it. His patch copy was secure, and I don't know how it worked, but I know I was secure too because I was running his copy from his machine that he left world readable. So again, Keep your keep uh, keep track of those little things. They will get you. One of the almost ones that would have been really cool was uh, a couple years ago when you actually had dial tone submission. The keys were all numeric, and you actually submitted them on a DTMF, which was really fun when everyone was scrambling to fries for wind modems and voice modems, trying to be able to like, script this stuff because no one wanted to spend dialing thousands of numbers into the phone system all day uh, to the phone they gave you. But one team actually figured out, and I'd love to find out how nobody that I talked to remembered, find out which team it was, but these guys actually got to the admin interface of the VoIP adapter and if they had managed to like you know redirect traffic and get other people's keys to them and then resubmit it that would have been the ultimate that would have been a great hack as it was they only were able to change the IP address on it cause a little denial of service that had to be fixed and then you know eventually got resolved but they did get breakthrough points so even though it was a kind of you know hack that was against the infrastructure which is often against the rules the moral of the story is if it's a cool hack, if it's a good hack, it's probably going to be worth some points. Uh, the other part is, again, if you ask, if you go to the organizers, they'll usually let you do whatever it is because they like cool hacks too. They want to see this stuff go on. So this year, I wonder if somebody from DD Tech is in here. Probably not. They're I'm sure very busy with that. But uh, the qualifiers they put on this year had a problem. It was Forensics 200 that was meant to be solved by getting a Vim swap file. So you had to actually get the swap file and figure out the changes to the file and the original file source to figure out some changes. Uh, there was another problem that was solvable with a Vim swap file that was not meant to be solvable with a Vim swap file. They were fixing a web service and editing it on the server live with VI. And uh, someone from one of the teams happened to go grab the swap file, get the source code to the prop. It makes it much easier when you have the source to a web service for some reason. I just, it's strange how that's happened. Uh, so again, it's not always the way you expect it to be solved that it gets solved. So there's a lot of ways you could ruin the competition. We know this. Denial of service attacks are generally just disallowed. It's just not fun. I know it's a hacking competition, and if it's clever, it's worth it. Do it. You get points. Ask. Always ask, because you'll get the points, but just play nice. That's all I ask. Once someone was ejected once for trying to cut someone else's network cable with a Leatherman, and that's just, um, he was totally busted too. Um, collusion is another area, by the way, that you could really just make this not fun. Thankfully, it doesn't look like it's happened yet, but you could very easily collude swap keys with somebody else and make it look like you got a service you didn't. So I've just told you now how to ruin CTF. Please don't. Please don't do that. That would, that would not be fun. So, great. You want to actually do this, right? What do you need to learn to actually get these skills to practice? What's the best way to learn to practice? Not a problem. You just need to learn a couple of skills. Once you've mastered those, you're set. You just, you, it's a small set. You, you'd be just fine. Um, there's, a, there's some links. There's a lot of sites online. I, go back to Atlas's presentation uh, from a prior CTF. He talks about from Script Kitty to Hacker and Three Sleepless Nights. It was really longer than three nights, but it was a, it was a good title. Um, but it really was over the course of you know, just this couple month period from the qualifiers from that year on to the finals where he just threw himself into this and got really, really good. He instantly got job offers from this afterwards, too, because this turns out to be a handy real-world skill set. Who'd have thunk it? Uh, reverse engineering and exploitation, go figure. Um, so you can do this. It's really about putting the effort putting the time in. In terms of tools and techniques, there really is no right answer. You need some scripting. You need to be somehow doing, for a quick kind of, response. Whether you're scripting up your scaffolding for your exploitation framework you do in advance, you need to be scripting up a new key submission. Oh look, now they're requiring that we use SOPA or XML to submit our uh, 
you know, to submit our keys. And so you've got to have some sort of familiarity to do this stuff. There's a lot of changes that get thrown in the mix to do this. Uh, if you're really, really good, I've seen the C is my script, C is my scripting language shirt. If you're that good, more power to you. There are people that are that good with C. But generally speaking, having a number of people just really good, the kind of the quick and dirty scripting is really going to be important. If you're not good at reverse engineering, you won't win. It's hard to score points if you can't actually exploit stuff. And there's always a few that are cool little gotchas, command injection, other little things. But generally speaking, you got to crack a debugger, you got to crack uh, IDA, and you've got to actually sit down and reverse this stuff. And again, this is can be tedious, can be time consuming, can be a difficult skill to learn, but it's totally worth it. Again, not everybody in the team has to do this because there's a lot of skill sets. Go back to those other roles. If you're the defense guy, you're the sysadmin guy, you're the network guy, you, these are vital, vital roles, but you're just never going to get points unless you can, can pull up Ida and do this. Although, as shown in the last talk, uh, Ida is very often uh, easily fooled and easily broken. So a couple of web links, uh, a lot of the resources for this. The first link is capture.thefla.ag. I wish that was easier to pronounce. I'm sorry. It's captured the flag with a period in between capture and the and the FL and the AG. I was just trying to be too clever, apparently. That's going to be where these slides are up at. That's going to be where it's just a whole bunch of other stuff going up there. So if you are interested in capture the flag, that will have everything you're going to need to know, links to all other write-ups from all the other teams. It'll have links to binaries. It'll have images from Capture the Flag years past so you can play with these binaries yourself. Uh, right now, it just has the presentation, but very shortly, AKA, when I get back on a network I trust, uh, it will be getting more stuff. Uh, ddtech.biz, the guys that are running the show now, I'm really looking forward to seeing what they come up with this year, and hopefully the contest is going live now, and we can all walk through and watch the scoreboard and see what's going on. Again, make sure you read those updated scores and try to figure out how would you find loopholes, how would you play, what's the strategy teams are using, walk around and watch from a distance in front of the screens to get a feel of what the teams are doing. Um, Nops R Us was mentioned in the last talk, too. That's the one that has all the write-ups. Nops R Us has write-ups for two or three years' worth of qualifiers and uh, finals, so you can find lots and lots of good stuff up there if you get stumped. If you want to go see what types of questions are liable to get into next year's qualifiers, go back and see that. Shall We Play a Game is uh, done in the style of uh, uh, war games. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, with uh, a little backdoor interface to a Whopper, and you can play, video, play games with it. But it has write-ups for just this year's qualifying round, so you can see those there. Uh, a couple other links. The, the, the one I want to do want to highlight is uh, Arsenico. I wonder if he's actually here to, uh, to this weekend. Um, has a great blog post that was called Hacking with All the Jail Time that turned into this great reference because everybody linked um, their favorite capt online capture the flag games. There's a huge amount of sites where you can go to do web security testing, capture the flag testing, of, of a lot of other types of capture the flags too. You can practice all this stuff. Again, practice the hacking with all the jail time. It's a great resource as well. So if you want to pick three books to write, uh, I hope Chris Eagle doesn't hate me for all the dirty tricks I've pulled on him, so I'll hopefully I'll try to pimp his book. It is the Bible for Ida, reverse engineering. Uh, Chris Eagle, like I mentioned, the, the captain of School of Root and just a phenomenal exploit and reverser, was the author of this. He released the book last year. This is going to be like the standard one reference book for Ida for the foreseeable future. It's extremely good. Um, a couple others that are very useful as well are Hacking the Art of Exploitation and Shellcoder's Handbook, because again, this is a binary exploitation kind of skill set. So, Fine print, uh, Creative Commons licensed. All the images, you pulled the slide notes, were from Flickr and Creative Commons. And that's about that. Questions will be off in the other room. Thank you all for coming out.